Hey, Newscast listeners, just want to give you a little information about the mission of the Newscast. Our mission stems from the mission of the Red Smith Banquet, and that mission was to support youth sports in the Fox Valley. Over the 57 years of its existence, we've been honored to give out over a million dollars to various youth sports organizations throughout the Fox Valley. The NoosaCast is looking to continue that mission and support youth sports as well. You can help us do that by donating to the NoosaCast and the Red Smith Sports Banquet. On today's NoosaCast, we're talking baseball with Aaron Hahn of the Wisconsin Timber Rattlers. Aaron is the Vice President of Baseball and Stadium Operations for the club. Tosh and I take an old look at new, thanks to Raleigh Winter and Associates. Our throwback this week takes us back to 1996 and the legendary front office man, Roland Heeman, came in and told us baseball stories like only Roland Heeman can tell them. And Tosh and I end the show like we always do with a little, it's forgotten and I'm never forgetting. So what do you say? Let's keep those earbuds in and let's get this show on the road. The sun is setting, right? It's a beautiful sight. Big view of the sky and the ballpark. It's gorgeous. I have a biased opinion probably, but yeah, I I totally agree with you, Joe. Welcome to the NoosaCast. What is a NoosaCast? It's where we bring local folk stories to life through conversation. All right, NoosaCast listeners, welcome to another episode of the NoosaCast. Uh, we're excited to bring you uh, what we feel is another great interview. Uh, going down the road of baseball again. What do you think, Joe? Yeah, absolutely, Tosh. Diving into the Timber Rattlers, we uh, we, we haven't talked about them a whole lot. We did a little food and beverage. Uh, oh, gosh, mm-hmm. Tosh, that's had to be last fall. But, uh, yeah, sit down and talk to Aaron Hahn, the number two guy with, with the T-Rats. Has been, he's been in Appleton a long time. It's great to hear his story. I, yeah. I've known Aaron a long time, but I'm not really sure if I actually knew the steps that he took to – you know, one to get into baseball, end up in Appleton, and then his progression through the the Timber Rattler system uh, organization has been was pretty interesting to listen to. And obviously, that ballpark, Tashman, mean, we we that's not even a hidden gem. That's just a gem, I would say, right in the in the, yeah. in the Fox Cities. Yeah, it's been spectacular. I mean, you know the old Goodland Field days. Oh yeah, and, um, you you know it quite well. Uh, but yeah, it's it's quite an upgrade going from Goodland Field to. It was originally the Timber Rattler Stadium. Now, you know, it's gone through several name changes, but um, what they've done to it and what they offer the uh, folks of the Fox Valley is is incredible. No, it absolutely is, and it's it's one of the things that just make this area so great. I think I, I saw, I don't know, I, does it seem like one of the cities from Green Bay to Fond du Lac is always on some top 100 places to live or top 25 places to live? I saw... One of the communities the other day just landed on, on that list as number one. So cheers to all of us yeah. for having great communities, Tash. And it's, it's, uh, it's things like the Timber Rattlers that, uh, that make that happen. Yeah, it's a great, great place to get out to a game. Uh, great place if you can uh, play hooky from work and get out on like a Wednesday afternoon or something oh, with their businessman special. Yeah, Those are always good times. All-you-can-eat picnic. All-you-can-eat picnic. Yeah. Uh, good craft beer scene there. I mean, they, they have it all for everybody in the family. So, um, yeah, we're, we're excited to uh, hopefully this to be one of many episodes that we uh, highlight some of the fine folks who work at the uh, Timber Rattlers. Yeah, with the absolutely. Timber we'll, we'll, we'll meander our way through their their organization over the years here. And be, it'll be fun to catch up because there's a lot of cool jobs. A lot goes into that ballpark into game day. Right. For sure. Well, Tosh, I, I you know. I think a lot of people know we record on Sundays. It happens to be Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to to Melissa. But uh, absolutely, any of you that have followed the Newsacast know that you can now plant. Right, Tosh? We, we can plant our our plants yeah. outside. We're good. Yeah, we're good. We're good now. We weren't like a month ago when people started. Right. But yeah, I think I think we're okay now. That's good. Yeah, that's good. I it's, saw people we, out there. We've hit that growing season. <laughs> absolutely, been. I, I've. This weekend, yesterday, you know, Friday, Thursday, Friday, um, the weather was nice, and 
people had all, all their flowers and bushes and shrubbery and plantings out there and ready to go. So they're planting and getting their first sunburn of the year. So yes. that'll be good for everybody as well. Get the aloe going as well. So always easy to forget sunscreen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Speaking of Mother's Day, I did learn that as a bike bicyclist, people know that I bike pretty much everywhere. I happened to be biking past a cemetery in the middle of a gorgeous Mother's Day afternoon. But uh, look out. Look out when you drive past a cemetery. It's uh, People aren't looking out, that's for sure. Their they're <laughs> average age, I think, of the drivers was maybe, I don't know, 86 and a half, perhaps, years old. <laughs> and... They were trying to get to the cemetery, Tash, and I was trying to get past them. There you go. So there you go. Well, just a public service announcement for next year. What else is new, Joe? Anything exciting other than uh, getting hit by cars this weekend? Uh, yeah, exactly. No, I'm actually going to talk about one thing that I did this weekend and, and uh, forgetting and forgotten for, for all you folks to stay tuned, a, a little shout out. But I did happen to notice that our good friend, uh, Maddie Wanamaker. I know you talked to her dad. She's uh, th they've got some exciting things. She's on her way to Europe, Tosh, for um, yep for another competition. She just she just posted on Instagram. Graduated from uh, with her master's in sports leadership this week. So congratulations to Maddie on on all fronts. Yeah, and I believe uh, Tom said that Maddie will be on the eight uh, person boat. So. That is a great opportunity for a medal in Paris. So that'll be uh, exciting to, to watch. And I know her family's heading to Switzerland as well to uh, check out the worlds uh, and obviously going to Paris as well. So great time for the watermakers and uh, hope that that boat and the boat that she's on uh, does a great job. No, absolutely. So it's fun to it's it's fun I, going into the noosa cast tosh i didn't know a whole lot about rowing and now now we've got somebody to pull for so we're we're big uh big maddie wanamaker fans for sure and we're <laughs> gonna we're gonna watch her row so good luck to her but uh, what did you guys do tosh mother's day here today what did um what did you and the family do we just kind of hung out we uh will was home and ethan and we went out for lunch and then we had some pizza at the house and uh both the boys had uh, some people over as well so we got to uh hang out and play a little uh bags and uh nice. just hang outside yeah it's fun nice day for it mid-season form with the bags oh yeah you know what you got to dominate that's you right. have to rub it into your kids right the old man still got it that's, that's the only way that they learn yeah, that's right that's <laughs> right you're not beating the old man that's for sure yeah. well you know what else uh we got some things to talk about as well i know um this will come out on Thursday, but this is a big week for lacrosse uh, as they head into some of the final weeks until they get ready to state. But Monday, Appleton United versus Nina. Um, we've had both Danny and Eric right. on uh, talking about their teams. That's a battle for the conference championship, basically. Um, they're both undefeated in conference. So um, Monday night at Appleton East will be a good game. I'm sure we'll have an update on that um, later. And then uh, on Thursday, when this comes out, Appleton plays Middleton in a rematch. Um, and that should be a great game at, at Appleton East as well. Yeah. And then it's, it's, I think, are they working on the seedings now? Uh, the, the, that announcement I think comes it's already, soon. I think one of them, the sec, uh, sectional one is already done. Okay. And I think Appleton will be playing Oneida in the first round. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, so good. Um, I'm not sure about where and everything like that. I assume it'll be at Appleton East, but um, yeah. I saw that. I didn't see sectional two yet, but um, yeah. So it should be should be a good good uh, good end to the lacrosse season as they head into the state playoffs. This is always fun. No, yeah. This now this is when lacrosse is fun, especially the NCAA. You can catch a lot of the games now on ESPN. Has I, mm -hmm. I highly suggest, and, and I see every single day night. It seems to have a top, you know, the top ten or top five plays on ESPN. Yeah. There's always the lacrosse goals, and they're in full swing in the NCAA now, making their way to the Final Four, which is always Memorial Day weekend, and that that that's the best lacrosse you're going to see uh, for Absolutely. sure. High school kind of mimics that, does the same thing. So, yep. Now's the time. The boys are hot ready to play and girls as you yeah. know we talked to I mean, we talked to marsh like you said tash last week and, and the girls are part of the wia as well so they're um right they're, they're playing as well so giddy up let's go it's lacrosse time yeah Full swing and then uh, you know this won't be breaking news when this podcast comes out but uh 
our one year coach at UWGB, yeah. Sundance Wicks, is, looks like he's leaving to go to Wyoming. So it's going to be interesting. You know, we, we talked before we started recording um, to what shakes out on this because Jordan McCabe, right. longtime Kakana uh, player for Kakana High School, went to West Virginia. Um, he was just announced as an assistant. So uh, we'll kind of have to see what happens uh, with GB and uh, what what they do and which way they they kind of turn to uh, see what happens with the program. Yeah, it's interesting, Tosh. I mean, he really he was an exciting guy. He um, mm-hmm. obviously had the, the the program headed in the right direction. I mean, that that was the set a record from having the worst, basically worst to best turnaround right. uh, record wise wins. And, and I, at first when I saw that, I'm like, what the heck? One year? Why, why is he, you know, doesn't make sense. But he is a Wyoming guy. He was on that staff before he came to Green Bay. So it does make sense. Yeah. But. You're right. It, it I, now when this comes out, like you said, we we may have all the answers. But you know, Jordan McCabe comes back. I mean, I you hope he's part of that staff, but that's always a dicey situation when a new coach comes in. So we'll yeah, see. We'll absolutely. see. I, I hope they keep the momentum going. It's it's been a long time since we've had a winner up there. But you know, you and I certainly we've talked about it. We we remember the Tony Bennett years, the Logan Vandervelden years. You know, all of those yeah. years back in the in the nineties, and that team was exciting, man. Uh, that was right. I mean, they were, they were made Sweet Sixteen one year here. I mean, they're, they're making the big yeah. dance. It's it's exciting stuff, Tosh. I love it. Yeah. Yep. It'll be interesting to see what happens. So hopefully, uh, hopefully, some excitement for that UWG program again. Yeah. Well, Tosh, all of the sports. I mean, I, I know uh, baseball is is North and Kimberly just played uh, there. There's they're competing now. The, the, the state championship run is, is going to happen there. Yep. So you, you can you know, it's 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 too much for you and I to handle, Tosh. But you, you can keep yes. up on the, on the news a minute. Uh, we're going to have one of those out this week. Uh, Appleton area sports page dot com covers it, you know, the old fashioned way, like a newspaper and. Lindsay right. on Twitter, she's uh, she's killing it as well, highlighting some of these things. So stick close to the Noosa cast, and and uh, we'll we'll get you pointed in the right direction. Of course, check out our our YouTube page as well. And Tash, we always need the likes, the subscribes, the subscriptions, the word of mouth, right? Absolutely. Check us out. Continue to check us out. And tell friends. And while you're doing that, Tash, why don't uh, yeah, let's keep this thing rolling. It's that time again, once again, for an old look at new. Brought to you by Raleigh Winter and Associates, celebrating 55 years. Did you know that in 1962, an Appleton junior high school teacher with a strong work ethic started a residential realty company? His name, Raleigh Winter. Three generations later, the Winters still hold true to a strong work ethic and an excellent reputation in the community. Today, Raleigh Winter and Associates remain actively involved in providing retail, office, and industrial users an affordable, well-designed working environment through the creation and or acquisition of quality real estate in the Fox Cities and even beyond new. So what do you say? Let's take an old look at new. All right, NoosaCast listeners, welcome to that old look at new, that chance for Joe and I to uh, dive down to the history of the state in Northeast Wisconsin and who knows where we're going to be looking at, but uh, we like to take a little look at history here. And Joe, what do you got for us this week? Tash, I stumbled across one of my mail routes has has the Riverview Gardens. We, we drive. It's, it's actually kind of easy to miss, but it's it's really huge. You can kind of see it off Memorial Drive. You can see it a little bit off of, of Oneida, but Back in the day, that that's a beautiful property. Now there's there's walking trails, there's biking trails, there's a lot of non for profit uh, gardening things like that. Yep. But back in, well, back in our lifetime, that was a golf course. It was a nine hole golf course. But I want to explore that just briefly. That little piece of land, and I didn't know about this, but that in 1898, it was founded in August of 1898 as the Appleton Golf Club, and that was actually Wisconsin's old, oh yeah, oldest private country club at that time, so I did not realize wow. that. Yeah, it was the, basically the first golf club founded in northeastern Wisconsin. 
began with 40 members, at least 120 acres from a farmer for a whopping $35 a, a year, Tash, $35 a year. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and a month later, quickly after that, they changed it to Riverview Country Club. And by 1906, they had seven members, and each of those members contributed $1,000 to purchase the land. And 10 years later, it became the Riverview Country Club. So in the early 1900s, you, the golf course was there, and it, uh, you know, it was just right off of downtown, and it, it stayed yeah. a golf course and uh, through through the 90s. I had forgotten this, but uh, the some an arsonist had set fire to the original clubhouse back in 1991. I had forgotten about oh. that. Um they, yeah. they rebuilt and it's still a beautiful clubhouse. It's got that kind of that old mahogany English feel to it. It's, yep. it's beautiful. So yeah, Riverview Gardens now, but Riverview Country Club uh, for, for a long time. And right. thought, you know what, Tash, that, that's my old look at new. Well, usually I'm kind of hitting it week by week, but this came across the feeds and I, I knew we had a baseball episode with Aaron Hahn and the Timber Rattlers and being a minor league affiliate of the Brewers. Well, I uh, saw this back in 1977. It happened to be June 12th. Um, Kansas City Royals were in Milwaukee to play the uh, Milwaukee Brewers at County Stadium. And somebody broke into County Stadium and stole <laughs> the Royals uniforms. So we had a game where the Royals wore the Brewers road uniforms and the Brewers were obviously wore their home uniforms. Right. So, yeah, I thought that was hilarious. That's I thought, awesome. I mean, obviously not hilarious. I mean, somebody ripped off uh, that is kind jerseys of jerseys and stuff. That is kind of funny. So, yeah, it's probably one of the only times where you had the Brewers versus the Brewers. Yeah. So <laughs> that's always funny, isn't it, Tash? Like when the umpire's equipment doesn't make it and they're, yeah. you know, they're, they look like a softball umpire, rec umpire or something out there. Right. Even sometimes the teams you know, whatever reason yeah. their uniforms don't make it. So, and, and this, Absolutely. this is one of those. So, well, I guess it was stolen, but that's <laughs> unbelievable. Un unbelievable. Yeah. But I love that. 1977 broke into County stadium, which if you remember County stadium, it probably oh, wasn't that do. difficult to break into. Yeah. You could <laughs> crawl through a window. Probably. Exactly. Wonder what happened sketchy. to those jerseys that the guy or girl sold them. Or? You know what? I didn't research that. Um, just kind of held on to this. I was debating about holding on to this until June. But I was like, yeah, I was just going to go for it. So what year was that? I'll have to look. 1977. 77. So what Brett was, Brett was playing then, right? George Brett, yeah. probably UL Washington. He was he the guy that had the toothpick. Yeah. yeah, the toothpick always. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hal, maybe did Hal McRae maybe play for them? I don't know. Possibly. I yeah. can't remember. But uh, well, <laughs> Dan Quisenberry, right? Some of the some of the pitchers. Right. Uh, yeah. No, I, I love the Royals, Kansas City Royals. They won. Well, Brett had what, and and right around 1980 had was almost hit 400, right? Hit high 300s for the year, and they won the World Series somewhere in 80 ish, I think. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, it was somewhere around there. I'd, I'd have to look and and see in that again, but um, yeah, purely well, going you know off what? of memory, Tash. There you go. I yeah, my memory is not that good for the Royals, so well, I could just be All completely right. wrong, and I'd never know. But it sounds good, right? <laughs> Well, I'm sure somebody will fact check that. That's for right, you. Steve Klein. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was an old look at new. Brought to us this week and every week by Raleigh Winter. So thanks, Dub. We appreciate it. <laughs> All right, Tosh, you and I finally get to talk to another timber rattler, and we could not have picked a better one. Aaron Hahn, who's the vice president of baseball and stadium operations for the Timber Rattlers, been with him, Tosh, for a long time, since 2006, yeah. and, and we get into it all. Yeah, it's, it's excellent. You're going to hear a lot. You're going to hear the many hats, not just vice president, but everything else that Aaron gets to do as well. Absolutely. A lot of hats. So enjoy the uh, enjoy the interview with Aaron Hahn of the Wisconsin Timber Rattlers. Yeah, I mean, how is everything going? I haven't actually seen you in quite a while, so everything yeah, going well? Yeah, things are good. Um, yeah, season's underway. Yeah, baseball season is here, so we're we're in the thick of it. Our team is on the road this week in Quad Cities, um, but we do have the Packers softball game. Yeah, yeah. never oh, a nice. dull moment. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, it, I, I mean, I want to dive into that, you know, as we as we go. But yeah, I was thinking, you grow up in Newton, Wisconsin. I mean, well, you know. 
10 people live there or whatever. I mean, did you ever think growing up that, that life would turn out this way? I mean, a career in minor league baseball and, and what's really cool to see is that you, you actually can have a career in minor league baseball, make it your hometown, make it your kid's hometown. And I mean, life's pretty good. I mean, you got a sweet gig. I, I do. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah. I mean, I was a baseball fan growing up, listened to the Brewers a lot, but really didn't know much about minor league baseball at all. Um, attended a, an Appleton Foxes game with a friend of mine back in grade school. And that was the only Goodland. Yeah. Field. That was the only time I had been to a, a minor league baseball game. Um, and uh, did an internship to graduate college from UW lacrosse and uh, went to Birmingham, Alabama, and spent a season there in 2004, uh, interning with the Birmingham Barons. So my second minor league baseball game was one that I, I worked at in, in Birmingham <laughs> in April of 2004, and was there for the season. And and then uh, my first Timber Rattlers game I ever attended was my first game when I was working there in 2006. So. So yeah, I didn't really know much about minor league baseball until I started and work started working in it, but um, loved it right off the bat. I mean, you get get your hands in a lot of different things. When you were at lacrosse, I mean, it was this. What, what were you hoping to do? I mean, what what would have been an ideal situation? I guess this maybe, but but what what paths were you kind of thinking of going down? Yeah, uh, I was I was very interested in baseball scouting uh, coming coming through college and, and following baseball like I did. Uh, really kind of a stat stat geek, if you will. I poured over box scores sure. and read uh, sporting news and, you know, whatever I could get my hands on on, on baseball stuff. Uh, again, just a big, big, big Brewer fan. Uh, driving tractor, cutting hay, uh, <laughs> side raking hay, whatever it was. I'd have Bob Euchre on and, and listen to Brewer again. Uh, oh. Pat Hughes back in the day, Jim Powell. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's the direction I wanted to go. Um, I had done a job shadow with Tom Flanagan with the Brewers. He's, he, honestly, I don't even know what his title is right now. Um, he oversees a lot of the minor league operations. He was farm director for a while. He actually started as a bat boy with the Brewers uh, way back when he was a kid and and worked with the Brewers for many years. So I job shadowed him when I was in college and I uh, was hoping to get a gig with the Brewers and internship with them. And they had some turnover in, in the organization when I was looking for my internship and I uh, was chatting with Tom a little bit and he recommended going to Birmingham. And that might've been, been, uh, you know, a, just a, a gentle push of, Hey, you may not get the one here. So go, go take what you can get in, in Birmingham. And, uh, Sure. And now we've crossed paths and we, we, uh, yeah, text, email quite often as, as we deal with things and in, in the brewer system and, and on the minor league side of things. So what is that like that feeling me you go yeah. lacrosse when you're comfortable at lacrosse and all of a sudden you just jump into the deep end of the pool. You're in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm sure you've never been there before. I mean, what, what the heck is that like? All oh, this is your life now. Yeah, uh, I actually had driven through it about a year before going to spring break with some buddies. Uh, we went down to Panama City <laughs> Beach, and I remember commenting as we were driving through, like, "Boy, this this city looks a little rough." And uh, a year later, I'm living there and working there, and uh, uh, loved it. Absolutely loved it. Loved the South. Loved people that I worked with were fantastic. Loved the organization down there. Uh, would have stayed if I could have, but some things drew me back home. And um, but yeah, it was a great, great experience. I mean, I, I highly recommend it to anybody if you're, you know, not tied down or anything like that. If you get get a chance to go somewhere else, just kind of wing it. Uh, you know, they they put me up in a, an apartment with another intern, so we were roommates for the summer. Uh, we still keep in touch. Still, still. That's awesome. Bet on. Uh, Wisconsin, Oklahoma State, and Packers. <laughs> uh, he was from Oklahoma, so a big, big Cowboys fan as well. But uh, yeah, met met a lot of great people there, and was a really great experience. Again, opened my eyes to to minor league baseball, which I didn't really know going in. And uh, yeah, wouldn't change it for the world. It was fantastic. So, as as an intern, 
in Birmingham, you probably wore a lot of different hats. So what were some of the things that you had to do uh, down in Birmingham? Um, well, the minor league side of it, everybody gets to pull tarp. So uh, <laughs> certainly on, on that. Yep. Uh, my role was in group sales, uh, ticket sales specifically. So I handled birthday parties. I handled uh, little league team parties, field of dreams going on the field. I handled boy scout and girl scout nights, uh, sleepover. There were sleepovers, uh, on the field, which bookended a week. So it was like a Friday night and Friday night or Saturday and Saturday. Um, so I put in, I think I put in 130 some hours that one week, uh, or in eight, wow. in eight, in eight <laughs> days, in eight days. Uh, so <laughs> quite a, quite wow. a stretch and, and didn't break me. So they knew, they knew I was uh, cut out from minor league baseball, I guess. See, you you <laughs> proved the theory that you can in fact live on ballpark food alone, right? Oh, absolutely. Been doing it for yes. 20, almost 20 years now. Yeah. Yeah. You look great too. <laughs> it's a testament to that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Going back even into your childhood, um, you, you mentioned you love baseball, listen to it while you're on a tractor. Um, did you play a lot of sports growing up and uh, through high school? Not a whole lot. Um, my, so we had a dairy farm and uh, I had an older brother. He went to college. Uh, so it was basically my, my father and I um, doing most of the, the work on the farm. So if I wasn't around, it was him by himself for the most part um, doing a lot of that. So I kind of, uh, I played, I played the little league, um, I played intramural basketball in, in high school, but uh, off and on played here and there. But uh, I loved it, love sports. I, I enjoy it, but um, I don't know. It, I just didn't didn't do much of it. And part of it was, oh, yeah. yeah, I think to to uh, not not uh, work my dad to death uh, or anything like that. So. <laughs> Did you ever think to to be a farmer? I mean, was that ever an option for you? An option for sure, but yeah, yeah, uh, that was my plan initially. As a kid, it's you know you kind of gravitate what to what you know, and uh, yeah, my dad told me you don't want to do this. There's no money in it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I'm gonna go do something else. So Is the farm still crazy. running? Uh, yeah, well, the he sold the cows when I graduated high school. Um, they still own the own the. They still live there. Still own the building. Still own the land. And my dad, he he, my uncle rents the land and farms it, and my my dad helps my uncle. So yeah, yeah, it's still in the family. So um, you're coming through high school then, and you're looking, and you you have this idea that you want to get in the sports at some some way somehow. Was lost lacrosse the place you, you know automatically? That's the one place you wanted to go, or the other choices that you were it trying was, to make? It was basically lacrosse. Uh, I was looking for a sports management okay. program and that was one of the few that was around. Um, it was far from home. And uh, so it kind of fit both of those. And uh, yeah, then the drive got really long and really old in a hurry, but uh, but it was, <laughs> it was a good experience out there too. Yeah. Yep. That's what I was looking for. So 2006, you come to the, come to the Timber Rattlers, you, um, I mean, you've, you've worn a lot of a lot of steps to 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 get where you are now as as vice president of, of baseball and stadium operations. What um, in in those early days? I mean, it was home. I guess being Appleton, as it was at the major attraction, to, to for you wanting to come back here. I mean, certainly. Well, there's a lot to get into. I mean, it's a, ends up being a great place. Um, but is that is that the initial attraction for you to come back home, so to speak? Yeah, I had I had moved back after the 2004 season from Birmingham. Uh, a hurricane, I don't know which one, cut cut it a day short, my internship. So I didn't have to go in the last <laughs> day of my internship and uh, <laughs> headed back home. Um, but yeah, then kind of took a season off uh, for some personal stuff. And uh, one of the guys that I worked with in Birmingham really pushed me like, hey, you got to get back into this. He was in, he was in California at the time. Uh, he was in Lake Elsinore, I believe at the time. And um, so it pushed me and, and yeah, I, I applied a couple different places and obviously right up the road, I was, I was kind of spending some of my time in Oshkosh. So uh, right, right down the road from Appleton and uh, sure. Yeah. Applied there and 
after, uh, I think, a phone interview and uh, in person, got hired and started there in, in February of 06, I want to say, and been there since. So, yeah, it's a great organization. Wow. Absolutely. I mean, the changes that you've seen and been a part of, not only just the stadium changes from 2006 to now are, are just, it's night and day, but just though even the way minor league baseball operates is completely different. I mean, it's incredible what you, what you, what you've experienced in your career. Yeah. When I was, so I started as a, a full-time seasonal employee. So just for the 2006 season in the ticket, ticket office, ticket department. And uh, about halfway through, they offered me full time to, to stay on after the season and, and work full time. And I, I was full time employee number 13. So there were 13 full time employees at the time. And I believe we're at 30 or 31 right now. So, yeah, wow. just, you know, the growth. I mean, the stadium's changed a lot. Um, you know, been, been some turnover in staff, but Rob is still leading, you know, the organization since well before the time 10 years before I started there even right he's still on staff and a lot of people that that came on shortly after me are still there so um we've had a good core core group there but yeah a lot a lot has changed um since since I started staff wise stadium wise absolutely even the business model right I mean in the beginning it's it's baseball and the promotions around it but now you have you know, weddings and banquets and, and yeah. business functions, you know, promote whatever special events it's, it's you name it concerts. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, that's almost more than the baseball. The baseball has really become almost secondary. Hasn't it? There, there's a lot going on there. There absolutely is, uh, but baseball <laughs> is still the core, uh, it's still absolutely the core business that we have, but, but yeah, we've expanded it a lot. I mean, we, we used to have, uh, shut the water off in the stadium and we'd have one running sink in the front office and one toilet right inside the front door that everybody shared. <laughs> and, uh, that was all the running water we had in the off season. And, uh, yeah, so we've come a long way from that. Uh, when we did the big renovation <laughs> after the 2012 season before 2013, uh, built the, the Fox club, upstairs and started doing banquets you know that that brought on a couple more full-time people on the food and beverage side um, chefs and and banquet staff to to oversee that so that was a big big uh jump you know from from what we had been doing and and staff wise too i i guess how do you come to the conclusion okay we, we need to let, let's expand into banquets now we, we need to build a fox club how, how do you as a group how do you guys come to that is it, do you kind of follow trends in minor league baseball? Other clubs are doing this. We need to start doing this. How, how do you get yourself comfortable enough to take that step? That that's a big step. Yeah, it is. Um, I mean, really it, it's Rob's vision and leadership that, that kind of spearheads all this, but you know, he's brought other people into it. I, I was part of those conversations and we, I mean, we, yeah, we talked about a lot of different things. We, we went around to different, different Midwest league ballparks that year before looking at some of the other stadiums and what they did, how they did it. Uh, I remember we went, we went North, we went around uh, the UP over to Midland, Michigan, um, checked out the Loon stadium over there, which is a beautiful stadium. Talked to them about you know, some of the things that they do um, with the banquet side and, and, other events. Uh, Fort Wayne was a big one that we went and visited. Uh, beautiful ballpark there as well. West Michigan, we checked out. Uh, South Bend. We have very good relationships with with the people running those teams as well. And, you know, they're very open book with things and, and uh, you know, sharing some of the successes they had, what they do a little bit differently when they, they built their stadiums, built their banquet facilities. Uh, so it gave us a good idea of what we were looking for, looking to do, how to be successful with it, you know, really pick the brains of the people who have been through it before and done it. So yeah, it was, it was a, it was a big step because you don't know whether it'll be uh, successful or not. You don't want this, this room to be empty 90% of the, the time, right? The only people yeah. in there during baseball season. So uh, I think we had kind of looked at what banquets were doing at that time as well, banquet facilities in the area. You know, was there a need for it? And I think there 
there was at the time and some some aren't around anymore from when we opened up so yeah we've we've right. made a good good business with with weddings a lot of holiday parties that we book in in the off season um so it's it's stayed very very busy absolutely with that expansion you really started to become a destination for people to come to um for the baseball but for other things and now you just put this massive expansion on again um and you you're a you're a crown jewel of minor league baseball now for the stadium. How has that really, uh, really changed this year? And, you know, as far as people's experience at the game? Yeah. Uh, it's been, well, it, it's kind of a, a roundabout story, I guess, but major league baseball had certain standards. They changed standards for minor league stadiums when they, they made the cut from 160 to 120 minor league teams and yeah. really raise the standards of things. And we, we met a lot of the standards for, for what they were the requesting and requiring uh, stadiums to be at and teams to do. But there were a couple of things we needed to, to do to, to get up to those standards. And our visiting clubhouse was a little too small, didn't meet some of the needs there. Our home clubhouse met the standards, uh, or the majority of them at least. But um, we needed to do something from a clubhouse standpoint. So we figured, well, if we if we tweak the home clubhouse a little bit, that will be sufficient for the the visiting team and check basically all the boxes. Um, but you know, if we're going to build something new, let's build it for the home team and let's do it do it right and do it well. <laughs> and uh, that turned out absolutely beautiful, fantastic. I know that's got a lot of the headlines and and a lot of our social media right off the bat. Uh, a lot of focus on that but then uh we wanted to you know we're doing this big renovation we wanted to do something that was going to be a draw for the fans as well and again back to rob's vision and and what he's looking for and he had this idea of of a slide and obviously the you know the connection with the brewers there the affiliation we have and that deep connection uh there it, it a lot of people are familiar with the slide and we figured, well, let's put a slide yeah. in and let's make it available for fans to go down and not just a uh, big furry mascot. So, uh, <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, we wanted, and we've talked a long time. We wanted to make it a 360 ballpark. We wanted to, for people to be able to walk all the way around yeah. the ballpark. Uh, so we were able to, to complete that goal as well um, and, and do that for people, you know, People don't like to sit in their seats a lot of the time for the whole game, they like to get up and walk around. And when it was just kind of a dead end in center field and left field, uh, you know, it's just it it doesn't quite feel complete. So now now you can take a stroll around, watch from to stand out in the outfield for a while. We have drink rail out there, enjoy a beer while you're watching the game from a different point of view. Uh, just gives yeah. We've heard a lot of great feedback. Just all the different views that we've added to the to the stadium. They love being able to walk around, check it all out. Uh, people found different places of the stadium they hadn't known existed before because they didn't have much of a reason to get out of their seat uh, other than to get concessions. So, so yeah, it's gone over extremely well. Um, so we're, we're good for the time being. Yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite thing to do at, at the ballpark at, at Fox city stadium it is walk around now, now to be, I haven't, gone yet this year but i'm i'm anxious to take the 360 walk but right i used to i mean i used to love go sit out by the bullpen watch, watch them warm up and you know get a different view of you know go stand out down left field or whatever it was, I, I love that now to be able to totally walk around that ballpark it's a great setting the sun is setting right it's a beautiful sight big view of the sky and the ballpark it's gorgeous i have a biased opinion probably but yeah i, I totally agree with you joe <laughs> Everything you guys have done, I mean, minor league baseball, we know is you really have to get the fans involved and keep them entertained. And I, I, we were season ticket holders when my kids were young for a long, for a number of years. And you guys have always done an excellent job with the fans. Is that, I mean, as a minor league person, is that a centerpiece, something, you know, baseball is here, but how do we get the fans to be more involved with our team as well? Yeah, I mean, that's that's our, our mission statement is essentially giving them the best experience so they, they want to come back. Um, and, and you can't do it from the baseball side of it because we don't 
play a part in that. I mean, we we could have the worst team in the world. We you know we don't construct that that team. So really, the only thing we can do is entertain them, give them a good time, a good experience, so that they'll want to come back and hopefully bring somebody with them, spread the word. Um, you know, it's we we don't live in a huge market, so you can't can't burn bridges and give people a bad experience and expect them to come back or, or you're going to run out of people, burn through people pretty quick. And, and uh, so, yeah, it's all about putting on a good experience, giving them a good experience, getting them to come back and, and enjoy it all over again. So we, that's what we can, can do is, is the promotions, the, the giveaways, um, you know, just give them that, quality experience when they're out there. They see value in it. They, they enjoy it. A lot of times they don't know who won at the end of the game. They have no idea our record coming into the game or any of our players on the team. But if they have a good time, that's what matters. What does your calendar look like? That's a lot of games, a lot of events, a lot of promotions, a lot of giveaways. What, what does your calendar look like? What is the planning process for going into the year? I mean, the year round process, um, what's that look like? Yeah, we always do a, a season wrap up, usually end of September, early October. Um, we'll have our our schedule for the next season. We'll we'll have a plan in place, you know, with game times and things like that. We'll we'll try to get that out early, but then we really start plotting everything in. So we want to we want to review the year we just got done with. So before it it's back of mind and we don't remember it uh we want to do that right away and really capture the good um you know what worked hey what can we let's do that again what can we tweak to make it even better uh what didn't go well is it worth saving with some tweaks can we make it into a positive and do a good thing do we need to scrap it um so yeah we really kind of build it from there we have our our kind of mainstays are our, our bobblehead promotions or bobblehead giveaways. You know, we've, we've kind of plotted those in and those have done extremely well over the years. Uh, our utter tuggers promotion or uh, the name, name the team for that. Um, so that weekend yeah, that went from one day initially to a, a weekend sure. in four days. That specific name and design. I mean, is that just you guys just brainstorming, you know that that whole idea how, how does how does how did the uh, you know the, how does that come about yeah that one came up so we purchased the team in the north woods league to start a team up in fond du lac uh yeah we enlisted uh, a company to come up with uh brandios or plan plan b branding or brandios uh, i forget which they were at the time but uh we had met with them over the years and chatted with them about different things. And we got them involved in the name, name the team and the, uh, the marketing aspect of it, the, the logos, all of that, they create a lot of that. And, um, that was one of the, the name options for that team in Fond du Lac. We saw that and we're like, well, I don't know if we're going <laughs> to, name a team that but, uh, <laughs> we'll see and we went with the, with the doc spiders and fond du lac and then uh, a couple years later just got to talking and hey what about uh, it was pulled from fresno fresno the minor league team out there the grizzlies they did a one-off the tacos tacos are huge out there so they were the fresno tacos and then Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania, they did, they're the Iron Pegs. They did a spinoff with the cheesesteaks. So uh, these different one-offs were like, man, these are going, you know, going really well. They're, they're well-received. They're selling a lot of merchandise. People are just going crazy. Stuff. Like, what if, what if we try, try this one? So we, we talked with Brandios again and got them involved with the, the logo and, and drawing this up and uh, yeah when we when we announced that one we had our golf outing that day so our, we're out on the bunch of us are out on the golf course with the team because uh, our players would golf in it it was during the season and our coaches and we're out there and i think we announced it at 10 o'clock in the morning and at like 10 20 our our merchandise director sends a text to a couple of us and says we're out of merchandise. 
<laughs> 20 <laughs> minutes into this you know, they're kidding me. and so he's he's looking into hey what can we do to get merchandise or keep selling and and so figured out a way that we could we could keep selling and just kind of put it on back order essentially and ship it out when we got it in and it went just absolutely <laughs> yeah, it sold a lot of merchandise. People just jumped all over it. Uh, ESPN picked it up. All these different radio yeah. shows and TV shows, uh, talk shows picked it up. And and yeah, it really had a mind of its own and it's it's continued to grow. We sold merchandise in every state, um, all 50 states right off the bat and different countries, which was an issue from a shipping standpoint. So yeah, it was it was something else. So it, it really that's where it grew from, and uh, has grown to this beast it is today. You know, when you have those big nights, I mean, you've had Jimmy Buffett nights. You have all these different nights. Do you you keep track and say, all right, we want to do this this year? Do you have a list that you continue to go off of? And if it's popular, bring it back, and maybe maybe not. Or what what does that process look like? Yeah, that's exactly it. So that's kind of that review that we go through at the okay. end of the season. And, and yeah, what went well, you know, what are, what are the things we want to keep doing? And that's, that's exactly what we do. You know, we, this one was good. You know, this was some of the feedback that we heard. So here's what we can probably do to make it a little bit better. We need to, you know, Jimmy Buffett night started out. Yeah, it, it did okay, but you know, Hey, we need a band. We need, we need to tweak our menu. We need to change the location of this because we need to be able to fit a certain amount of people and really create that atmosphere that we want to do um, and give to the fans. So, so yeah, it's it's a lot of a lot of talks, a lot of planning, a lot of a lot of discussion on you know what's really gonna gonna work the best, what we can do to to grow these because. Um, you know, there's a lot of successful things. There's other things that just never took off. So we're always looking at other teams too. What are other teams doing? What have they had success with? Uh, we'll go to meetings. We, we used to have league meetings. We, we still have them on occasion where it's just idea sharing. Hey, what worked? And everybody comes with their best ideas for the year, their best promotions, you know, what drove ticket sales, what drove merchandise, what kind of marketing did you do that, that maybe other teams aren't doing? And really sharing a lot of ideas. We're not competing. We're not in the same markets, anything like that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's really a, a great, great industry to be working in. Uh, a lot of the people have the same, you know, same interests, same likes. And uh, so you got a lot in common when you're talking about things and you can talk, you know, especially have a couple beers in there as well. And the ideas really start <laughs> flowing at that point. So, uh, but yeah, it's really, really carrying over a lot from year to year uh, that people yeah. get, you know, it's some people just come out to one game a year and that's, Hey, I yeah. like, I like that game. I enjoy coming to star Wars night, Harry Potter night, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, those types of things. So we just want to give the fans what they want and what they, what they keep coming back for. Are the baseball winter meetings, are those still a, a big event for you guys in the off season? They, they still happen. Um, we're actually limited now to how many people can go. So there were, there used to be awards given out there uh, prior years. So one time we took like 15 people to the baseball winter meetings, which is kind of unheard of, but we won <laughs> one of the big awards that year uh, in minor league baseball. So we had a few awards and staff we took a lot of folks to it. Uh, now it's, it's just two. So this last one, just Rob and I went, um, it's really focused on, they want owners there, or people representing ownership, which Rob does. Um, uh, he's part owner of the team. And then, uh, there's some operations based things, team based things. Okay. Uh, major league baseball is very involved in things now. So, you know, there's a certain procedures and things that they want to go through and go over. So it, it's toned, toned back from what it, what it had been, uh, but there's a, a business seminar that they've they've kind of changed. There used to be a promotion seminar. Now they do this business uh, business meetings, and uh, so a bunch of our staff went to that last year. So a lot of our sales staff, our marketing staff, uh, corporate sales staff went to went to those meetings, and that again was that idea sharing. 
Um, there wasn't as much of that at the baseball winter meetings. That's more informational. And here's what, here's what we're changing up for the year, what we're looking at doing okay. a lot of those types of things. Sure. Hey, getting back to concerts uh, real quick, I mean, what, what is the process for, for booking a band or, or, or actually finding a, I mean, cause you've actually had some large bands there where they're set up in the outfield, with large stages. And, and you know, the, the, uh, when the symphony plays, I mean, that's a great event as well, but what, I mean, do bands approach you? Do you actively go seek some of the larger groups? I mean, you, you can get some pretty good sized touring acts in there. Yeah, we've, we've tried for a lot of acts and we've gotten a few, few concerts out of it. So <laughs> it, it's difficult. Um, it starts with our schedule. Um, okay. we're, we're so full on, on games and then we have a waiting list for weddings already for next year. So we don't have our wow. schedule yet for next year for 2025. We have a waiting list for weddings. So once we get our schedule, then they start booking the weddings and then kind of here's the leftover dates that I have to, to book concerts out of. So sure. uh, <laughs> it's difficult. So, you know, if there's, there's interest. So we do work with a, a buying agent. Uh, we've worked with them for a number of years to, to try to get concerts and we've gotten some. Um, so they have the connections in the industry because just coming in off the street and, you know, Hey, we want to put on a concert. Uh, a lot of times they won't, won't give you the time of day because we don't know who you are, if you're good for it, anything like that. Right. You know, and they don't want to bring a big band in to, to somewhere that they don't know how it's going to go or who these people are. So that gives us some credibility there. Um, now that we've done a few, I think, you know, we may get a second look or we're definitely getting into more conversations, but they bring a lot to the table. So we work with, with that group. So really from there we'll float out, okay, these are the dates that we have available and they'll float it out to their different, the different agency. So William Morris, CMA, um, and the people that they know there. And then, Hey, these are, these are the options, some options that we have. And so we can decide to put in an offer on somebody or not. And really that's kind of where it goes. Uh, so we'll, we put in a lot of offers over the years, um, you know, and that's all you can do. And then you sit and wait and see if <laughs> they, they work on their routing. So they put their whole tour schedule together and are they going to be in the Midwest, you know, for these two or three days that we throw, throw to them, if it can work great, if it can't, you know, most of the times that that's the case, but, but yeah, the first, first one we got in 2016, when we started doing that was Goo Goo Dolls Collective Soul and yeah. that show sold out and yeah, just unbelievable. So we've, from there, uh, we've been trying to replicate those kind of numbers. We, we did really well, uh, with the show in 2019, Bush and live, yep. uh, went extremely well, was very close to a sellout as well. Um, just, yeah, it's, it's a great, great feeling to have those shows when, when everything's okay. happening, when the concert's out there, when the weather's good and you think <laughs> you've gotten past all the issues that have the do going on or go into a show like that. Uh, just on un, unreal, you know, the, the euphoria that you feel of, Hey, this band is happening. You got seven, 7,500 people here cheering it on and singing along and yeah. like, wow. Oh. That's that's a job well done right there. Hey, NoosaCast listeners, you can find every episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Please help us grow by subscribing or sharing the NoosaCast with friends or follow us on Facebook, X, TikTok, or Instagram. Do you have a wish list of, of who, who would you hope? I mean, if you could pick anybody, who, who would you want to bring in? Uh, well, half of those people are dead now, I think, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to have a wish list because we don't even know, uh, I mean, who's touring or what their prices are. So we just sure. know, you know, some of them you, you just can't afford, you know, you yeah. never be able to afford the, uh, you know, Garth Brooks or Kenny Chesney or, you know, some of the, the huge acts covering it all, the Guns and Roses, the Rolling Stones, whatever. But, um, <laughs> you know, so you're kind of looking a step below that, that you're not selling out a, a 
professional stadium of 60, right. 40 to 60, right. 80,000 people. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've looked at some bigger country acts over the years, um, some rock shows here and there, um, some pop, but, uh, it's it's just so hard to to get everything to stars to align to to get those yeah. to, to actually happen. So we we go in with an open mind of okay, what when we see the list of who might be available on those days, okay, what you know, do we think it can draw in this market? Do we think you know, the radio stations play this band enough? Do you think there's a good enough following? You, you just start doing a little bit more research, talk to some of the radio stations about it. And, and really try to make the numbers work from a ticket standpoint. How many tickets could we sell? What price do we need to sell them at? You know, we, we don't want to price gouge people. I mean, we see some of the ticket prices of concerts these days and like, I'm not, I'm not forking over that. Yeah. It's outrageous. We try to keep it reasonable for, for fans as well. And and just try to get a lot of people there because it's a much better feeling. Yeah. Full. And if it's 2000 people in a, see six seven thousand people for a show yeah. i'm thinking the band goose would be the perfect fit for this scenario <laughs> joe's going to his fish days here <laughs> no, a current jam band they'd be i think they'd be the perfect fit and they i think they could sell 7500 tickets all right all right <laughs> aaron i had a was going back to when you started with the timber Rattlers. um did you know pretty pretty quickly that this is a place that you wanted to stay that you were excited about and you know what was it that made you want to be here as long as you have been now yeah uh yeah it was it was right away i would say um the staff right away um just made me feel you know included in the staff there wasn't you know any of this uh, seniority thing or you know you're new, you're, you're not even full time or anything like that. It was arms wide open from everybody. I feel, okay. um, from Rob on down, Nikki, uh, promo Nikki at the time and Angie Saransky. <laughs> and, uh, so a lot of folks that, that were there for a long time and, and ran the show. Uh, yeah, just a great staff. And we've tried to continue that as some of them, some of the, those folks have, have moved on, but, uh, yeah, it, it's, top down, just a, a great organization, take care of their staff, um, really take pride in, in the team and the stadium, um, uh, taking care of the fans, taking care of people again, just trying to give them that value, that experience that, that people are looking for that want to make them want to come back, come out and come back again. And I, when I look at, at your staff, you have a lot of the same people coming back year after year. Yeah. You've had a lot of people who have worked with you full time for, you know, 10 plus years as well. And I think that big, pretty much goes to what you just said. You guys are a family. Yeah. I mean, you, you spend a lot of time together, more, more, <laughs> more time with them than I do my family in the summer. That's no question about that. <laughs> so uh, you gotta, you gotta enjoy what you do and enjoy the people you work with. Otherwise it, you burn out pretty quick. So those people, you know, it's just not the right fit. They don't stick around that long because you do, you do work a lot you spend a lot of time there. A lot's expected. And, and, uh, you know, you see what, what other people put in and, uh, the time and effort and energy. And if, you know, you're not willing to do that, you figure that out pretty quick. So yeah, the group we have is, is fantastic. Um, it's ever changing, you know, in, in any business when you have 30 plus full-time people, there's going to be turnover here and there, but, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good staff and people get along really well. People are at different stages of life too. You know, yeah. Some people have kids, some people don't, some people are married, some people aren't. Um, so you kind of have your groups that you have a little bit more in common with, but if everybody's pulling in the same direction, you're going to be successful kind of off topic a little bit I, and it's a ball player related question I, I i know the milwaukee brewer organization players but when they get the call up to, to either go to the next level or whatever level they're, they're getting the call up and i i just saw this online the other day where, where a player was alerted while he was on second base that he was moving i think he was moving up to the big leagues or whatever um what is that like that that just that initial 12 hours 24 hours for that player he gets the call you're going to the next level how do you get him out of town how does he pack all his stuff and just move on to the next town uh 
I haven't experienced it myself. I haven't gotten the call up yet, Joe. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know one of these days. But uh, but <laughs> yeah, from what I what I gather and hearing and talking with some of the other folks, basically the brewers say, "Hey, you know, you're you're moving up, and here's your plane ticket. You're leaving tonight. You're leaving tomorrow morning, and you're heading, you know, wherever that might be." Um, and then it's just kind of a whirlwind for them because they're, you know, packing their stuff up. They need to figure out my vehicle. If I have a vehicle here, am I getting it? Am I driving it? Am I shipping it? You know, whatever it might be. But, uh, you know, just just this, I mean, it got to be euphoric feeling of, you know, this is what they're striving to do and, and keep moving up and moving up the ladder. And, and, sure. Uh, so, yeah, just fantastic. I saw... So Tuesday morning when the team left, um, Tayden, Tayden Hall, he had been with us a little bit after he got drafted uh, last year, I believe. And he was he was in Carolina to start the year uh, where he could play full time. And uh, he just got called up then. So I saw him. He was he was out by the bus and, you know, just seeing the greeting that he had with the other players, they know each other, whether from last year or spring training, they're pretty much all together. And, you know, just that big smile on his face, seeing him, you know, again, realizing his dream and getting closer to it of moving, sure. up, the, moving up the ladder. So, yeah. It, it, maybe on the opposite spectrum, when it, when a big leaguer comes down down for rehab, yeah, we often hear stories that they, they treated the club really, really nicely. Do you have any stories of, you know, of a big leaguer coming down and doing rehab and, you know, I don't know buying out Buffalo wild wings for the team or whatever. How, how do they, tr how do they treat the, the, the players uh, during their time? Yeah, they, uh, they've all been really good. Uh, all the guys come down. I don't know if it is, is mandated or what, but yeah, they're all buying a, a impressive <laughs> spread post game. Uh, there was Outback Steakhouse a few times. I remember Texas Roadhouse and, uh, <laughs> Famous Dave's, which yeah, some of those aren't around anymore. Uh, kind of crazy. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, they they put on a really nice spread. It'll be steak. It'll be you know, some higher end stuff from what they they normally normally get, and they get a, they get a really good post game meal uh, nowadays. But uh, you know, back back when I first started, it wasn't anything special. I can tell you that <laughs> and, uh, when these bigger years came down, but. But uh, yeah, they have treated everybody exceptionally well. Uh, last year, Willie Adamas, he was in, and he was he had he had gotten hit by a foul ball in the dugout, and you know was kind of dealing oh, yeah. with that. And he was just up by us to take take ground balls, get some infield in, and he wasn't going to rehab at all. He was just going to go right back to the big leagues. And from what I heard, he he pressured the Brewers and said, "Hey, I want to I want to get a rehab in, you know, get some at bats before I'm." I'm eligible to come off the, the IL. And uh, so, yeah, chatting with him in the dugout a little bit, we had the Packers softball game after the game that he rehabbed. So the day before, he's like, hey, if I, I stick around tomorrow, can I play, play in the softball game? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he did not. He did not take part in it. But, uh, you know, just just that that personality, that attitude that they have. They come back down and, and Brandon Woodruff two years ago said, you know, he, he found the enjoyment again of, you know, seeing it with these players and and remembered then kind of remembered what it was like coming back through and enjoying the game like you do. And, and that push to be that drive to to, again, just get promoted and, and work your way up. So he came back as well last year again and. He's he's a professional. I mean, he he just goes about it and and uh, in the right way, as most of these guys are. And they they come in, they have a job to do, but you see the the human side of it uh, from that standpoint too. So it's it's really cool. Talking about the players, I mean, you don't have any control of who you're getting, but you you're getting some young young men, young kids, <laughs> yeah. um, coming up and playing. How, how you know when they come in that that first time to. Uh, to timber at, to the stadium and uh to play for the timber rattlers what is that like seeing some of the excitement and it's got to be kind of you know it catches on throughout the entire staff i assume 
Yeah. Yeah. These, I mean, most of the young guys that we have 17, 18 year old kids, uh, they're usually from some Latin American countries and it's, they come in to start the season. It's April and they may see snow for the first time. And there's a reason <laughs> like you wouldn't believe. And, and uh, like, how do you play baseball <laughs> in this kind of weather? Uh, so that's kind of an interesting look to it. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's all over the board. We'll have a 17 year old. We'll have a 25 year old on our team. Yeah. Some guy who, you know, is kind of on the, on the road for the first time or, you know, leaving home and, and somebody who's been in through college and, you know, been in the minors for a couple of years and, and really kind of knows what it's about. So it really is really differentiates on every team. You just have a lot of different, different attitudes and personalities. And, and some guys are just, Hey, what can I do? What, you know, what can I be a part of? I'll, I'll do anything and everything. You have any visits I can go on or can I help with a camp? And then other guys are pretty much, you know, pretty uh, to themselves and, and just, mm-hmm. you know, don't want to get too involved in things, but it's just, you know, that's personalities, but uh, no, it's, it's really cool to see them kind of starting their journey and, and the talent that comes through and you can really see it with some of these guys, just, they can really hit, they can really run, they can field yeah. they and they can pitch. Um, <laughs> and a couple guys already get moved up this year. It's, yeah. Yeah, there's some some talent there in this organization. Absolutely. Has it been a noticeable difference in your eyes being that the high A now or higher A than, than previous years, or is it not really? I would say a little bit more. Yeah, they're probably a little bit more refined um, with their talent a little bit, um, a little more raw previously, probably. Um, but yeah, there's. The low A, they would skip us sometimes with their, with with some of the bigger prospects or high draft picks if they were a college guy, especially Brandon Woodruff. He didn't he didn't pitch for us coming through the system. Uh, he skipped low A at that point. Um, where now you don't see that as much, uh, just with the level that we're at. You know, they really kind of need to hit each level for the most part. Uh, so yeah, I would say a little bit. Seems like a little bit more refined skills, a little less raw from what it had been. Are you still uh, checking stats every day, box scores, just personally, just just like you always did? Um, just I don't have the time anymore. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> but, yeah. I get a I get a minor Brewers minor league report every day, and I try to at least check that out and check out sure. how how the rest of the system is doing. But yeah, I don't. I don't keep track of major league baseball at all. Like I used to, I mean, I'll catch, catch brewer games here and there and not even all those, uh, a different major league team or major league game. Probably not a chance. Sure. <laughs> do, do you play any fantasy sports at all? I don't No. I, uh, used to do some fantasy football here and there. I ran fantasy baseball leagues back when I was in high school and, you know, really doing a lot of that stuff. But, uh, yeah, family man, uh, family kind of took over sure. all that, and, and I'm enjoying that aspect of it. So, so no, uh, I, people keep me updated on their fantasy teams and fantasy sports. <laughs> that's fine with me. Hey, there's there's no better conversation than somebody telling you about their fantasy team, is there? Right, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or their three fantasy teams, or what you know, how yeah, they right. have. So, oh good. <laughs> <laughs> so, Aaron, I was going to ask, you know, a typical day when you have a, a game day, yeah. what does your day look like from start to finish? Um, it it really varies. Um, but essentially, we will get in. Um, a lot of times there's a game the day before, so it's kind of mm-hmm. get through the mess of cleaning up from the, the day before um, and, and going through whatever I didn't get through the night before <laughs> while we had a game, but um, we have a, a staff meeting, a game day meeting every day to, to go over everything. So all of our full-time staff are in there, a number of our interns as well, uh, if they're able to make it um, and covering everything, every detail of the game that day, that night, whatever, you know, whatever time it is. Uh, so we cover all of that information um, just make sure everybody's on the same page because we do have, you know, with all the different giveaways and promotions yeah. and whatever is going on that night, 
there's a lot to cover. Um, so we all kind of get on the same page at that point. Um, uh, and then from there, I'll usually try to meet with our team, like talk to our coaches, check in with our coaches, make sure they're doing well. Um, uh, I'm on the operations side of things. So with our ops team, make sure that the stadium's looking good, that everything got cleaned, everything's maintained. Do we need to fix anything? Do we need to, do we need to mow the lawn? Um, <laughs> doing some of those things, uh, check in with our groundskeeper, make sure, you know, he's got everything that he needs, how's weather looking. Uh, so really kind of monitoring a lot of different things, checking in with a lot of different people, um, check in with our, the visiting team when they get in, make sure everything's good on their end from the hotel to the clubhouse, to the field, um, our visiting clubhouse manager, check in with him, make sure he's doing well, that the visiting team has got everything they need, that they're respecting him and our facility and all that type of stuff. Um, check in with our home clubby, make sure he's he's good and he has everything that he needs from laundry standpoint or uh, pants, jerseys, all those types of things. Um, I oversee the and staff the ushers, so I'll meet with the usher staff before the game, run through all the details of the game that night as well. Uh, they come in, they wipe every seat down in the house and make sure everything's kind of, that's the last kind of finishing touch to the stadium, making sure everything's okay. good and ready for the team or for the fans when they get in the stadium. And then during the game, I, I mean, it, it's really kind of all over the board. I've, I'll help in parking. I was out there last weekend for one of the days uh, we were short on money takers for the day. So I was taking money in parking. I could be running pitch timer for the game. I've done that a few times this year, uh, but I'll be checking in with ushers, with fans during the game, checking in in the clubhouses. Uh, when it was cold early in the season, run hot chocolate and coffee down our, our dugout and make sure the coaches are staying warm down there uh, and help with, <laughs> help with a drag in game uh, between inning breaks, maybe a promotion, you know, it, it wow. varies. And then after the game, we'll, we'll clean the stadium after the game. Usually we do that. Uh, even if it's at night, we'll pick the stands, pick up all the big garbage. And then our ops team, we put on backpack leaf blowers and go through the stands and blow all the little stuff, the popcorn, the, peanut shells, the sunflower seeds, and blow that all into piles and sweep that all up and kind of do that first major cleaning and then get ready for, we'll have the cleaning crew in in the morning. They do the touch up of bathrooms and clubhouses from there. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of, and that's kind of nice. I mean, it's, you never know kind of day to day, you have an idea of what you'll be doing, but you know, different things come up or some people can't make it or so you never know where you're going to be short staffed. Maybe the next day could be working in a concession stand here and there. If, you know, you need to sure. Those spots. So um, it's just good to, good to learn it all. So you can jump in wherever and by no means do I know it all or know every position. There's, <laughs> there's some I will not touch or, or get close to uh, a lot of the technology stuff in the video production yeah. room. I don't want to touch anything in there, <laughs> blow something up. So that's a huge operation, isn't it? The, the production side, and that video board that you have. I mean, that that's that's certainly something that's changed in your time. That that whole side. Yeah, yeah, that's that's grown a lot yeah. uh, from some yeah matrix of just light bulbs and whatever it was back then to color and and much much bigger nowadays so and then yeah we added another one in left field a ribbon board uh, so it just it makes the experience a lot better you know you can show a lot more information on there you can show your pitch speeds and pitch counts and who's pitching and your lineup and your batting averages and all that stuff um, yeah from what we used to be able to do so and it's it's for the fans. It's it's upgrading those amenities to make it more enjoyable for them. And you know, not, this isn't even sitting in the ballpark, but just driving on on forty one. Now the lights that you've added, I don't I don't know if those are LED lights or whatever they are on the yeah. poles. I mean, that's and changing colors. That is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the lighting upgrade we did a few years ago, LED, and yeah, there's up lighting now. So uh, for a lot of holiday parties, we'll put green and red. You know right the other or if they have a certain color for their company or yeah whatever it might be if it's breast cancer awareness month or something like that we can do pink or 
any of those things. So, so yeah, it gives you a lot of a lot of options, a lot of opportunities to to just make the event a little bit better for whoever whoever's out there. Absolutely. Did I hear you correctly? You wipe down or the ushers wipe down every single seat before this, the gates open. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Wow. That's one of the few probably stadiums that do that. But but yeah, our ushers are are fantastic. They do a great job. And yeah, that's been as long as I've been there. That's what what they do or what we do, what we we insist on. I mean, we want a clean seat for everybody and it makes it very difficult when it's raining uh, when gates open yeah. and they wipe down seats and then it starts raining so now they're going back over and drying them for people and going through a lot of towels so yeah sure oh that's impressive you have an experience coming up on the 10th um you got the packer softball game so what kind of experience is that for you <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it varies. Uh, you never know what you're going to get with that one, really, <laughs> or who's all going to show up uh, for that event. Even we'll have you know some idea of who's going to show up, but then uh, you get surprised sometimes by who does show up, or uh, let down sometimes by people who don't show up. But uh, it's Donald Driver and Jordan Love heading that one up tomorrow. Uh, Excellent. So yeah, looking forward to see that. I'll usually be around the dugout in a dugout, um, just kind of helping with with um, the management team that runs that. So it's it's one of the okay. marketing agents for Donald Driver uh, who heads that up, and they've been involved with it for a long time. So working with them, um, but then helping just kind of be security, be another set of eyes down there by the dugout, by the field, by the fans, make sure. Everybody's behaving and, and nobody's getting out of line or, uh, you know, doing things they shouldn't be doing, making sure that they have everything down in the dugout that they need. You know, we have drinks and, and food and all the different things down there, uh, bats, gloves. You just never know what, what's going to happen or what's going to come up. Uh, there's been some some interesting <laughs> incidences that have happened during those games previously. So yeah, it's, it's wild. It's wild. So I have a question for you. Um, I teach high school and I have students who mention that they want to go into the marketing, go into sports management or different things like that. What kind of advice do you have for those high school kids who are looking to go to college and looking to get into the business? Yeah, especially high school kids now, if you're in the area, apply at the stadium, work, work at the stadium in, you know, any of the, the positions that we have out there. So ticket sales or team store concessions, whatever, just get around the business a little bit, get to meet some people in our organization. Uh, you know, they'll, if they don't work out there, we'll hear from them in a couple of years, hey, they're applying for an internship. Uh, but we don't know them at all, you know, so there's yeah. no, no extra uh, little push that they have toward, toward hiring them because we don't know who they are. They haven't worked with us before, where if they have, we know them, they're coming out, they're working every summer for a couple of years or at least one season. Yeah. They were a really good employee. They did really well and you know, they had a good attitude. That's kind of what we're looking for is, is uh, from a, from just a game day standpoint, working games in one of those different areas is we want somebody with a good attitude who's willing to learn. And then that carries over to, to interns as well, because they're going to, they're going to be able to experience a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So they're going to be working a lot with us and a lot of ours. So it's really maintaining that good attitude through it all. Uh, you know, there's going to be ups and downs obviously, but uh you know, if you can kind of laugh about your third tarp pull of the day or whatever, or, you know, are we going to get a fourth out of this one yet or whatever it might be. Uh, but having that good attitude and, and willing to learn, um, you know, they're, they're not going to see our full-time staff sitting there telling them to go do something that we're not willing to do ourselves. So, okay. Um, but, but yeah, that's what I would recommend is, is start working out in a game day position get familiar with our staff and that'll give you a leg up. If you're looking for an internship down the line, absolutely. Yeah. If you, you do well in that position, we'll look at you for another position for sure. Okay. 
is it truly all hands on deck when when that tarp call comes out well i mean there's a few that are exempt because uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we don't want broken bones or uh, anything sure, like that sure. but, but no it's i mean every full-time staff 98 percent of them are are uh, gonna be out there and if yeah, the ones who don't, we wouldn't let take part in it because we don't want anybody. To sure. But, but yeah, it's it's anybody who's available. Yeah, we need to get down to the tarp now. It's uh, it's windy. It's coming fast. It's going to come down hard. <laughs> we need to try to play yet tonight or tomorrow. If we can't get this thing on, we might not be playing in a couple of days. So, yeah. yeah, it's it's absolutely all hands on deck. I, I know we're a little over an hour here, but I, I, I wanted to ask before you made the, this this last renovation and when, when MLB was was making the decision on, on cutting minor league teams, I mean, was was there a real danger that that Appleton could have been cut? Or I mean, were you guys always pretty confident you you had what it what you needed to do to to, to keep a team here? Um, we we had discussions about it. Um, you never really know. I mean, it, it, when it's, it's not something that you control that, you know, you don't make that decision. So you just never know. Um, we felt good. I mean, we obviously felt good with our relationship with the brewers that they would want us to be their affiliate at this level. Um, we, we felt we've done a great job. We've won awards through minor league baseball. We've been recognized for things. So you hope that you know, means something to, to Major League Baseball when they start looking at that. Our facility was, was a good facility. Yeah, we, we upgraded massively now, but before that, uh, you just don't know because all teams really had to make some alterations and additions to, to get to those levels. So we were no different than others, uh, some of those regards. But uh, geographically, you know, are we are we outside the demographic or the geographic region a little bit you know where where we are I mean, it fits with our league but they start condensing things down you, you don't know if that's going to work against you or not so yeah you we felt we felt good about it but again not not being the, the decision maker there you just never really know and we're glad the way it turned out i mean we 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 know a lot of people on teams who got caught and there were a couple yeah. from our league that got caught in yeah, yeah it was it was tough i mean you feel really bad for those folks and and uh you know keep in touch with them and just reach out and support how you can but um, sure <clears throat> yeah it was it was a big big decision and a big shake up for our for our industry no question yeah absolutely i mean in those teams I mean, and they become fabrics of, of of the community i mean i cannot imagine Appleton without a minor league ball club it just, it, that's never been a thing in my lifetime yeah and and a lot of these teams recovered well so like Burlington Iowa Clinton Iowa they they started teams in in a different it's a college league as well um, but a different league and they've done really well um, okay. they start up a little bit later I think they start in May so they really cut out the April they still have baseball and when it comes down to it, I, I think they still have the community support. I mean, you don't have that major league affiliation anymore, right. but mm -hmm. they're still, you know, doing the baseball thing, giving them that good experience that that they've done over the years, and you know, they've been been successful with that and have done really well within those leagues and and raised that league up a little bit from where it had been too, with two good members there. So they've yeah. continued to do you know do what they did best, and and it, it's worked out. Um, Again, it, I think they've been successful biz, from the business sense too. Of it, it's that those April games are tough, so they cut those sure. off, take the the more successful months anyway, and, yeah. and just keep doing their what they normally do. It's been good. 
Well, kind of like the Doc Spiders, right? I mean, that that's a great experience going to that game. I mean, it's it's competitive baseball for sure. It's not, you know, it's it's not timber rattler baseball, but the experience is every every bit as fun. Yeah, we like to think so. We had a whole bunch of our staff down there today. We we were getting the stadium ready for the season. They start on Memorial Day. Okay, uh, nice. We were yeah cleaning up and, and putting up signage and putting up tent canopies and all sorts of fun things down there. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been great for for that community down there. Uh, I've known Fond du Lac for a long time, and and to have that that quality of baseball there. Um, you know, to have something like that in the summer, throughout the summer months, to say their Memorial Day through about mid mid August, uh, yeah. so really a you know the nice weather time, and and yeah, they do they put on a really good product. I mean, a lot of our staff help help with those things down there, so they're they're a part of our staff as well. I mean, we we own okay. that team, and and uh, they're in our staff meetings every Tuesday and say we were down there today so some of our full-time staff do kind of pull pull two two positions they they'll do graphic design for us and and for Fond du Lac and uh, corporate sales they'll sell down at Fond du Lac as well as for the timber rattlers so there's some overlap there and and definitely a lot of overlap from uh, some of their staff have come up in the beginning of the season to uh, to get experience with what they're going to be doing down there. So from a concession standpoint, who's going to be running concessions down there. He's been up by us and, and learning from us and, and helping us with, with some of our early season when we're short staffed, because we don't have some of our, our high school staff or college staff back yet. So it's been really, really good. Um, a really good decision, I think, to, to put that team there. It's an opportunity for our staff, for their staff to, to grow, to work together and, we, we can try different things down there and see how it goes and, and try things sure. for us to see how it might go down there. Um, so kind of a testing ground both ways as well. So yeah, really good, good yeah. uh, team down there. And they've been successful, won two championships so far already. So, yeah. so they're doing well. Yeah. No, and the stadium is beautiful. I love it. Aaron, I, I, I mean, I appreciate it. This is, this is great. I, I, I love your story. I love, yeah, I just love minor league baseball, the Tim Brattlers, what they mean to this area. And, and it's, yeah. it was, uh, yeah, it was good to chat. Yeah. Well, thanks for reaching out. I appreciate it. And always fun to talk baseball. So Heck yeah, <laughs> thanks for being on. Nice to meet you. You as well. <laughs> Take care. What you're about to hear is only a part of the speech by Roland Heeman. The entire interview is on our YouTube channel. Just search NoosaCast or check out the link in the show notes. Head over to YouTube to watch the entire speech of Roland Heeman. Red Smith Sports Awards. Banquet Throwback. Red Smith Award, of course, goes to someone who has made some unique contributions to sport in Wisconsin. And also epitomizes the great values that Red Smith exhibited. Let's give a Red Smith welcome. In our 1996 Miller Nice Guy Award recipient, Mr. Roland Heeman. Thank you very much, Seg. I didn't realize that I've been around that long. I tell you, when I got the call from Dan Ornstein in uh, early October about the fact that he told me that I would be honored tonight here in Appleton if I so chose, well, believe me, it didn't take me long to accept. And the follow-up calls from Mike Reese, very heartwarming to have Dear friends, remember you after you haven't been around this area for quite some time. And I assured them that I would come in the night before 
so as to avoid any inclement weather problems. In my mind, right along, this banquet was to take place on a Wednesday night. <laughs> so last night, I'm packing, retiring early so that I'd be nice and fresh to come to Appleton today. And I get a call from Bill Smith, and he said, Roland, where are you? We've been waiting for you at the airport. So now you can see that I'm no longer a general manager, and that's what happens. You can't be a general manager if you can't get your days straight. <laughs> Joe Garagiola Jr. is the general manager of the Diamondbacks. How many people know who the Arizona Diamondbacks really are? <laughs> Robin Yount does. He lives in Phoenix. You'll be hearing from us. We don't know what league we'll be in, American League or National League, but in 1998, we'll be playing Major League Baseball. We're not a softball team. We're not a hockey team. <laughs> we're a baseball team. My association to Appleton dates back to the early 50s. I had just joined the Boston Braves organization, and the Boston Braves had a working agreement with Appleton. Bob Beesman was the business manager, and Judge Parnell was connected. And as a matter of fact, I made one of my first mistakes in baseball. John Mullen, who was the farm director, had given me the title of assistant secretary for any of our farm clubs to execute the minor league contracts. And one of the young players who had just joined the organization had signed his name in the line for club official. And when the contract came across, I signed it where the player was supposed to sign. The contract went through the National Association, came up to Appleton, and Bob Beesman called John Mullen. He says, who's this new player we have named Roland Hemond? John says, who? He says, he can't play a lick. He said, don't worry, he's not reporting to Appleton. But I almost fulfilled my desire as a youngster to become a professional player and play in Appleton. But there have been some great players here. And the many players that you have supported on and off the field plays a major role in where I am today and some of the successes that I've had. I want to express my deep gratitude to many of you who had these minor league players to your home, some of them living in your homes, and the affection you showed them and the support, because I run into many players who have played at Appleton, and through the years they have nothing but praise for how they were treated here and how kind you were to them. I was in Colorado Springs recently for a, a roast of Rich Gossage, and Rich brought it up about how much he enjoyed it here in Appleton. I guess the fact that he was 18 and two that year also played a role why he was so happy. But he made the jump from Appleton to the major leagues the next year. Terry Forster had done the same thing the previous year and bought Johnson the same thing before. You know, many times you sign players and you're not comfortable as to where you're sending them to break into the major league ranks. But boy, I had utmost confidence whenever a player was headed for Appleton. I remember when Bill Veck, Mike's father, had seen Harold Baines play Little League Baseball in Eastern Shore, Maryland. And when Bill acquired the White Sox, he says, there's a youngster in Eastern Shore who has one of the greatest swings I've seen. Now, he says, the last time I saw him play a role, and he was around 11 or 12. <laughs> so make sure that we scout him well. Well, Paul Richards went to see him. Walt Widmayer, one of our top scouts, so Harold, Benny Huffman, Leo Labasia, and they all put the stamp of approval on him that we should draft Harold Baines. And then I asked Paul Richards, I said, Paul, do you think he's going to make a real good major league player? He said, Roland, all he has to do is find the ballpark. And he found Goodland Field. This was his first stop. And the next year went to Knoxville, the next year Iowa, and from then on to the major leagues and a long career. And what a thrill it was for me this past year, late in the season, to be on the grounds of Camden Yards by a home plate presenting Harold Baines with a silver bat, commemorating the fact that he had just hit his 300 home run in the major leagues. Harold has never changed the same quiet, humble, capable clutch hitter that he was when he showed up here and continues to be and is now rejoining the White Sox. But when I go through names like Bart Johnson and Lamar Hoyt and Jerry Hairston and Ron Kittle and Greg Walker, I mean, on and on, Ron Cockerweiss and so many others 
who wore the Appleton Fox uniform proudly, Manager John Bowles, who did such a great job with them, Steve Novarita, now in the front office. One of my great rewards in my profession is seeing young people do well, join the professional ranks and become major league players, and some of them go on to All-Stars and Hall of Fame, and also the front office people. And there are four people here tonight, of which I have great pride to have been associated with, and I can foresee all four of them, four of them becoming general managers in the major leagues in the future. John Bowles, Steve Novarita, Billy Smith, and Mike Veck. I have three others who are Major League General Managers today with whom I've been associated, and they have said that I have played some, some role of some sort in helping them in their careers, and that's Dave Dombrowski of the Florida Marlins, Doug Melvin of the Texas Rangers, and Walt Jockety of the St. Louis Cardinals. So when you make the rounds of this baseball world and you see people represent our game so well, how good it makes you feel, because this is the greatest game in the world. And tonight, to see Joe Hauser in the audience really thrills me. Joe, that was a tremendous article written by a writer from Los Angeles this past summer. Bill Pachi, I believe is his name. I read every single word of it, enjoyed it thoroughly, and it brought back such great memories. And I was glad to find out where you were located. And I do hope you did receive my letter. It didn't have a complete address, but I figured if I put Joe Hauser someplace in Wisconsin, they would find you. <laughs> I might ask if there's a lady in the audience here tonight. Is Pauline Wesley here by chance? I guess not. In 1953, Pauline Wesley represented the Wisconsin State League at the baseball convention as Miss Wisconsin Baseball League. I took a shine to her. <laughs> Flew back to Milwaukee. Her mother made sure that she sat in the three seaters that we had in the that side of the plane. Now I think it was two and then it was an aisle in those days and then my seat. In any event, Pauline Wesley, I've never seen since, but she was a gorgeous young lady from Green Bay, and I just thought maybe she'd show up tonight. <laughs> i tell you who was runner-up to Pauline Wesley in that contest. Kathy Grant, who later became Mrs. Bing Crosby. So you know, People told me later, they said, Roland, you do have a good eye for talent. <laughs> John Fabre, while I have you here, my wife gave me instructions before I left Phoenix this morning. She said, Roland, do you think there's a chance that you can get some Super Bowl tickets now that Green Bay has been eliminated and you're going to the vicinity of Green Bay? John, I'll see you on the way out. I'm running out of things to say. You know, it's overwhelming to come back and be amongst friends that you haven't seen for quite some time. And that's why I was so anxious to get here last night to be with two of my dearest friends, Milk Dreyer and Helen Dreyer. Since I failed them last night, I'm gonna stay an extra day and not leave for Baltimore till the following day, whatever day that is. <laughs> and Robin Young, one of the first speakers said that you brought tears to his eyes. Well, I'll tell you one thing, you brought tears to my eyes often, too. <laughs> Whenever we played the Brewers, I'd always say, gee, I hope we don't see Robin Yount and Paul Molitor in the ninth inning. But no matter which way you played it, they always showed up in the clutch, and they delivered time and time again, two of the greatest players I've seen in my career. I want to be there at Cooperstown the day you enter Cooperstown, when you are inducted. <laughs> the 
because you displayed on the ball field in a great manner on how the game should be played. Never, never did I ever see Robin Young hit a ground ball and not go full blast all out to first base, thinking extra base and always playing aggressive baseball from the time he took the field till the final out. But you know, on second thought, Robin, looks to me like you can still play. <laughs> you, you live in Phoenix. The Arizona Diamondbacks opened in 1998. You can get in Cooperstown five years after you're through with the Diamondbacks and you can name the position. <laughs> now that's not tampering, right? He's not under contract with the Brewers, is he still? Would Bud Seeley get mad at me tonight? I hope not. He's another dear friend who won that nice guy award. Well, I want to thank the Miller Brewing Company also for making this award possible. And since it is such a great evening, and Milk Dryer is having his birthday, I think it's time to wish him a happy birthday. We have a cake for him, and I also have an Arizona Diamondback cap for him. So make sure he wears it around town. Thank you very much. Well, Tash, another great throwback. And remember, you can catch our throwback and all of our past throwbacks every Sunday. And with that, Tash, that signals, well, we're, we're at the end of this show, but we can't end without a little It's Forgotten and I'm Never Forgetting. So what do we have to get off our chest this week, Tash? What is forgotten this week? Well, Joe, you know, um, Will is in his first year of college, and it's that time of year where it's winding down. So I had to run down there Friday. Um, and help move some stuff out of the dorm. And you know what? The dorm Donner Hall was built in 1961, and there's no elevators. Oh. And, of course, you had to live on the first, fourth floor. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to forget, and, I, you know, I, I did it myself, lived in the old dorms down at Whitewater. But uh, forget those old dorms and the f- four flights of stairs carrying down futons and refrigerators and, Everything else there is. Oh, and the heat. <laughs> yeah, it gets so hot the up there. Yeah. Oh, I feel and for the you. Smell, the smell of a bunch of boys living in dorms. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty disgusting. Yeah. He made it, though. Year, <laughs> year one, he made it. Year one. Year one down, so that's awesome. It's good stuff. <laughs> good stuff. Is he in the dorm again next year? or? Just... Yeah, he's in a newer dorm. Okay. So this one has an elevator, and uh, it's a little bit nicer, so... Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes after the summer and well, you know, we'll just make the move back down again. So yeah, always good stuff. So Joe, how about yourself? What are you, uh, what do you want to forget? Well, Tash, it's not by choice that I want to forget it, but it's my eyesight. I've been, uh, been wanting <laughs> it's, it's forgetting itself. And the time came where I, I had to go, uh, well, I made an eye appointment, Tash, and I am, I now wear glasses, Tash. I have glasses. <laughs> so my eyesight is forgotten. Yeah. I mean, I, I can still see without them, but I tell you, the whole process of picking glasses and, and, and just wearing it, it's been difficult. It's been, I've, I've got, um, <laughs> they're not bifocals, Tosh, but they're, what are they? The transition isn't the right word, but they, they go from, yeah. you know, the prescription on top to the bifocals on the bottom, but you can't see the old yeah. line. So it, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm trying to get used to it. I do know that I need a pair of sunglasses, so I think that's going to be my next glass glasses purchase. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my there eyesight is is forgotten without the aid of spectacles. So, <laughs> how about you? What are you never forgetting? Well, you know, obviously, as a science geek, this was a a great weekend, uh, the tenth and eleventh to see one of the most spectacular light shows that we have around in yeah. the Northern Lights. I mean, I saw them all the way down into Florida. Uh, this was like the largest um, s- solar storm that we've had since uh, 2004. Um, so, yeah, it was spectacular. Got out Friday, drove north and late late at night and uh, just saw a spectacular show. Um, did you see them? It, it was. Yeah, I did. Where it did was you fantastic. go? I went, I went almost to, uh, to Seymour. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 
Yeah, just to get out of the lights and stuff. Did so you see more? Really, really cool. I saw, I see more and saw a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, old man. That's a good, good dad Hey-o. joke there. Hey, yeah. Where's the drums? <laughs> but yeah, no, it was really cool. Uh, you know, honestly, it, it could be a once in a lifetime opportunity. How strong this was, and you know, it, it was just a, it was really cool event. And I, I don't want to forget that this is only the second time in my life that I've actually seen him in person. So man, it's pretty, pretty awesome stuff. I saw some of the pictures looked incredible. I've, I've seen him not that intense, but I've, I've seen him up in Door County. I, I missed this one. Yeah. Um, kind of. Well, kicked. the pictures, I don't, they, they over exaggerated a little bit Okay. because with our phones now and everything we have, uh, the phones automatically come up with like a night mode and a long exposure. Sure. sure. And it really, you don't really see that intense with the naked eye, but it was still pretty spectacular. Internet never lies, Tosh. Yeah, exactly. Well, Joe, how about yourself? What are you never forgetting? Well, Tosh, I didn't get to see the never the Northern Lights because I am never forgetting what I did Friday night, and and I had a great time. I went to the Commodore Club. Now, I have never been there. wasn't even one hundred percent sure where the Commodore Club was, but it is downtown. I went to see Tay and the Neighborly. Um, so their final show. Tay is actually super duper pregnant. Uh, they're she's gonna have a baby any day it looks like uh, but they they played mile of music and they are absolutely incredible yeah. but this room tash first of all the sound mm-hmm. is fabulous it, it maybe okay. fits i don't know if it fits 100 150 people in there kind of high ceilings when you know just a classic downtown building yep. it's been a couple of different things i think the coffee shop is still next door I'm not even sure what that yeah. one's called but the Commodore Club, man, it was a great, great show. It was with some great people and, and just had a great time. But I was blown away by, well, she's, the whole band is incredible, but her voice, hey, if you check her out on Spotify, there's five or six tunes that they have. Um, just soulful, R&B, incredible. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I'm never forgetting. I, I just, our music scene, Tosh and Appleton, it just blows my mind. I feel like each week we're discovering some new place that has music that's better than the last so certainly yeah, friday night was so good that i missed the northern lights so I, uh, <laughs> well you always got the pictures joe I, I always have the pictures so and i, I definitely have <laughs> fond memories of uh, friday night had had a good time and tash we wrap up another show always a hoot no doubt absolutely that's what we uh you know keep pushing out content we hope you enjoy it and remember to follow us on all our socials and um check out youtube for those uh throwbacks see you next week folks thank you for listening to another great episode of the NoosaCast. we'd really appreciate it if you hit up our social pages subscribe like follow and don't be afraid to engage Head over to our YouTube channel to get exclusive content like the full interviews and speeches from the past Red Smith banquets. Thanks for listening to the NoosaCast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and tell a friend. A huge thank you to Digstown for all the music in today's episode. Catch a gig or find them on Spotify. Help us grow by subscribing wherever you get your pods or sharing the news to cast. Follow us on Facebook, X, TikTok, or Instagram. One of the best ways to help us grow is to leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Northeastern Wisconsin Sports Advancement is a 501c3 organization. Our mission is to raise money, provide support, and bring greater awareness for youth sports organizations in Northeast Wisconsin. We do this primarily through the Red Smith Sports Award Banquet and the NoosaCast. Each year, we give back to the community through three initiatives, the Every Kid Plays Grant, the Gives Back Initiative, and scholarships to student athletes.